everybody. I'm Kevin Johnson, Dean of the Law School, and I thank you for joining us in the latest installment of the Racial Justice Speaker Series. Now, this series is sponsored by the School of Law and the Elke Center on Critical Race and Asian Studies. We began the Racial Justice Speaker Series in fall 2020 as a way of helping our community process and understand killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and others, too many others, while addressing the broader implications of systemic racism in US society. We also wanted to widen the perspective to show how racism in its terrible insidiousness affects all areas of law in society in many different racial groups. In our series, thus far has encompassed family law, corporate law, immigration law, legal history of discrimination against Asian Americans, anti-Muslim laws, much more. Now, today it gives me great pleasure to introduce two of our own professors, Professor Darian Shansky and Professor Dennis Ventry, who provide context for thinking about the intersection between tax policy and racial justice, two topics that many people wouldn't order wouldn't think go together, but in fact, really do, as we'll hear about later on. Please help me welcome Professor Darian Chansky, Dennis Venture. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Darian and I are delighted to uh, have the opportunity to present to, to all of you and, uh, and to be part of the, the King Hall Racial Justice uh, Speaker Series. Um, Come on. <laughs> so you wouldn't think that tax invades certain areas of the world. In fact, as I tell my students all the time, tax invades everything that we do. Uh, and if you keep your eyes open wide enough, and if you're observant enough, you will uh, you will come to see it. Um, in 1960, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King was indicted and prosecuted in Alabama under its perjury statute for falsifying tax records. Um, Alabama at the time actually had a tax evasion statute, but the tax evasion statute, unlike the perjury statute, which was uh, which which was a felony if convicted and punishable uh, by imprisonment, the tax evasion statute was a simple misdemeanor, and uh, Alabama officials wanted Dr. Martin Luther King in jail. Uh, Dr. King was the first and the only person ever charged in Alabama under the Alabama perjury statute for falsifying, for falsifying tax, uh, his tax records. Um, amazingly, Dr. King was acquitted by a jury of his peers, 12 white men. Uh, in response to that, this is Dr. King after the trial. In response to the outcome of the case, it's worth reading a little bit of this. A few years later, Dr. King, uh, Dr. King wrote, this case was tried before an all-white Southern jury. All of the state's witnesses were white. The judge and the prosecutor were white. The courtroom was segregated. Passions were inflamed. Feelings ran high. The press and other communications media were hostile. Defeat seemed certain, and we in the freedom struggle braced ourselves for the inevitable. I am frank to confess that on this occasion, I learned that truth and conviction in the hands of a skillful advocate, in fact, he had two of them, Bill Ming and Hubert Delaney, of skillful advocates could make what started out as a bigoted, prejudiced jury choose the path of justice. Um, notwithstanding the acquittal, uh, Dr. King continued to be investigated and harassed by state and federal tax officials. Um, this particular case provides us an entree, Darian and and. Uh, and, and for me to, uh, and Andre, to talk to you about uh, the intersections of tax and racism, tax and racial justice. Uh, it also gives us an opportunity to, again, re remind you to keep your eyes open because tax is everywhere. In fact, this case uh, provides an example of that. In response to Dr. King's indictment, uh, a new committee of his friends was formed, uh, a committee Committee to defend Martin Luther King and the struggle for freedom in the South. Uh, this committee made up of a bunch of his supporters, uh, Northern supporters in particular, and some uh, luminaries, uh, took out an ad in the New York Times denouncing 
the indictment, the prosecution, and the and the entire affair. Uh, also made a reference and denounced those individuals, those state officials, not naming them uh, specifically, but denounced their participation. Uh, all the officials were outraged. One of them, uh, the Montgomery County Police Commissioner, one L.B. Sullivan, sued for $500,000 in damages. Uh, the case went before the Supreme Court sued for libel uh, for $500,000 in damages. The case went before the Supreme Court and is now uh, a bulwark in our constitutional freedom of press, uh, uh, New York Times v. Sullivan. Um, and so you have an example of tax weaving its way uh, into various aspects of our lives. And so today we're going to try to expose you to a little bit of that when it comes to when it comes to um, when it comes to tax and racial justice. Here actually is the is a copy of the or pardon me a cop uh, a mimeograph of the New York Times. Uh, full page ad that was taken out. Um, and that's just what I had to say. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Darren Chansky. <laughs> oh wait, I, I apologize. I have to I have to do the agenda too. So there are many factors that go into uh that reflect and reinforce the racial implications of tax in the United States. What we saw in the uh in in the case of Dr. Martin Luther King's tax prosecution, indictment and prosecution involved clearly racial discrimination and racial animus. It involved a whole bunch of other stuff too. Uh, and so we're going to talk about all of these factors today and try to weave them into um, into our story. Racial correlations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the tax treatment of different socioeconomic classes and the types of income that we tax. To the extent that we give uh, tax preferences, let's say to high income individuals, we're giving tax preferences to white Americans overwhelmingly over, over non-white Americans. Uh, to the extent that we that we give tax uh, that certain tax preferences to certain kinds of income, let's say capital income instead of wage income, we're giving tax preferences to, to, to white taxpayers overwhelmingly over non-white taxpayers. Uh, the politics, history, political bias, and lobbying that 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 uh, that undergird a lot of these discussions, we'll see it uh, throughout the presentation. We'll absolutely see it when we talk about a recent study that um, that made some uh, that that got the attention of various news outlets about how tax audits of African American taxpayers are as as much as three to five times higher than that for um, for for white taxpayers. Um, the complexity of the tax system, both from the standpoint of compliance. And so to the extent that uh, that the tax authorities scrutinize those tax provisions that are de designed to help low and middle income Americans, those low and middle income Americans are, are disproportionately non-white compared to higher income Americans. They also uh, might, not, might not be quite as uh, savvy in terms of financial literacy. English might not be their primary language, et cetera. And so, so complying with those provisions, although designed to help them from a policymaking standpoint, uh, if you're gonna scrutinize them for audit purposes, uh, it's gonna come down hard on those individuals because complexity makes it tough for them to comply, even though they very much wanna comply. Also complexity from the standpoint of uh, getting at high income, business income, Americans, in terms of auditing. You need an expert, skilled, uh, robust enforcement among tax agencies. And uh, that has become more and more difficult as we'll see later on. And then in terms of administrative limitations, you know, the, the funding of the tax system, the expertise of uh, the, the, just the size of the workforce, the expertise of the workforce, et cetera, um, ends up leading sometimes to really strange results. And so the particular study that was highlighted um, this la the, over the last couple of months, and in fact, the study that, uh, that Dean Johnson saw um, in the New York Times, discussed in, in the New York Times, which then immediately he reached out to us and said, hey, you guys come talk about tax and race. And so we're here to do that. There. Hi, everyone. So an honor to be here and I am going to take the next section um, and we're going to focus on particularly the relationship between race and tax in the context of the federal income tax. Um, we're not giving a pass to states, we'll talk about them a little bit too, but mostly we're going to talk about the federal income tax. Now we're talking about the federal income tax because as these pie charts show, uh, I know it's lunchtime, but these are not delicious pies. Um, the um, income tax is the dominant way um, the federal government um, finances itself. So that's the main reason. But 
three of you, also the dominant way the state of California finances itself, right? So uh, when we're talking about income taxes, we're talking about trillions of dollars in the primary way the US government finances itself. Just going back quickly to this slide, look at what happens to the slice of pie um, that used to be contributed by corporate taxes um, and it is now contributed by corporate taxes. And that's not something we're gonna focus on, but that's a big distributive impact. So corporate taxes are primarily paid by shareholders and shareholders are primarily wealthier and wealthier people primarily whiter Then the shrinkage of that slice of pie and the increase of other taxes is a shift in who is paying um, for the cost of government. Um, so another thing to note, just in terms of the hidden story behind seemingly very boring charts is that the fact that the US and state governments together rely primarily on the income tax is itself a big policy choice. Most of the rest of the world relies much more on consumption taxes. Those are taxes you know mostly in the context of sales taxes. So the OECD average, so other rich countries, they use um, sales taxes for about a third of their government. Quite simple. I don't even know what that is. I don't even care. Well, here's why you might care. This is a chart showing the size of government expenditures. Again, see the OECD is the rich country average, right? The U.S. is way below that. Um, so the U.S. simply raises less money in tax dollars than most other countries do. And one reason we, we don't raise as much money is that we don't have a national value added tax. Um, if we did, we could raise a lot more. And that is obviously a major choice, right? Why don't we have a, a, a thorough social safety net like basically every other country that's similarly wealthy. We just don't raise as much money. Um, okay, so that's the background. Here's some other interesting things about the income tax system. So a tax expenditure is when the federal income tax should collect money, but does not collect money. So for instance, I am taxed on my income, right, as a professor here at Davis, as part of my as part of my compensation package, I get paid health insurance. Um, to the extent my health insurance is paid for, that's income to me. It should be taxed. It is not taxed. Um, and that's called a tax expenditure, right? It is a deviation from the regular rules of income tax um, in order to achieve some policy goal. And tax expenditures, there are many of them, and they are expensive. So all these numbers are billions. They might okay, say, well, okay, what is... Again, it's a lot of numbers, a lot of, I mean, what is the significance of it? Well, one way of looking at the significance is that, right, sneak out from behind the podium, right? The tax expenditure budget, right? So the amount of things we could collect under the income tax, but we do not collect under the income tax, right? Is larger than any other a major program, right? Bigger than social security, right? Bigger than Medicare and, and, and Medicaid, way bigger than non-defense discretionary. Right? And so that means, and here's another chart showing the same thing, is that when we talk about tax expenditures, right, special tax breaks, we are basically talking about the way the federal government is doing social policy relative to through direct spending. And if we say the tax expenditures are bigger than direct spending, maybe twice as big, that means in studying tax expenditures, we're studying the, you know, two thirds of the way the federal government is doing social policy. So what does it look like? Well, it turns out that for most of the tax breaks um, given in the tax expenditure budget, right, they tend to skew towards the wealthy in terms of where the tax expenditures go. It's easiest to see at the bottom. So preferential tax rental capital gains, right? What does that mean? That means you sell a stock, you sell some other investment, you get a preferential tax break. Well, who owns stock? Well, by definition, it's people who have a lot of wealth, right? That's just like, it, it, it just follows. And so, again, what we're looking at is one of the main ways the federal government is spending money and how it's distributed. And much of the distribution is to use, you know, quasi jargon upside down, meaning it mostly goes to the bottom versus the top, but not always, right? So the earned income tax credit, which we'll do a little bit of a deeper dive on, um, which is a wage subsidy for the working poor, again, by definition, is going to help the working poor. And it does a pretty good job. And you might say, okay, I see that it is going more to the working poor. Is it effective? Well, the answer is it achieves a substantial amount of poverty reduction. And lots of, and which is again not surprising, right? It is the biggest tool for poverty reduction versus all others, right? So you might say, look at that. Um, food stamps, right? Food stamps is important, but it's not nearly as important um, as the earned income tax credit, which which goes to the significance 
of tax expenditures in terms of actually conducting um, social policy. So then the question is, okay, well, we have a lot of upside down tax expenditures. What does that mean um, as to race? So um, right, to begin to explore this, we wanted to take a look, make sure I'm on track here, at um, right, how is um, income distributed? And so this is relatively recent income or, or information um, showing right that um, income is not equally distributed, right? So to the extent that the income um, distribution skews, that the income benefits of the tax expenditures benefit the wealthy, it also benefits um, um, white people versus minority groups. That just follows from these income distributions. What does that look like in terms of the details? Or I should say, one of the, if we go back to um, these benefits, we say, well, look, the mortgage interest deduction, right, is a subsidy for housing, right? It skews to the right in terms of people having more wealth. Um, why is that racially significant, right? It's significant because there's a big gap, right, in who owns housing. Does that make sense? Okay. So then, um, uh, before going um, one or two more slides and then handing it over to Dennis, one question is, well, okay, there's this um, overlay between race and class. And the question is, well, why? And the answer is, I, I couldn't, here's a summary of why, and I couldn't even get the whole summary on the slide because it goes on and on and on, right? Um, because there's a reason why um, um, racial minorities right, have less income and less wealth, and that is because of overt racism for a long time. And then, and then um, you know, implicit stuff on, layered on top of that. Um, and so, um, right, it's like a game of Monopoly, right, where some people get $200, some people get $0, right? So it's um, the, the overlap of race and class, right, is not um, an accident. Um, and so here's a, a list of the tax expenditures, which is very recently done by the U.S. Treasury, showing who gets them um, by racial category. And as you'd expect, right, in basically um, in, in most of the tax expenditure categories, racial minorities get less um, relative to, to other groups, um, tracking um, income and wealth. And last slide, just a source on this, this is because um, the US Treasury um, recently has really undertaken a systematic attempt to um, study the relationship between um, race and taxation. So you can um, find all sorts of interesting stuff on the website. And I will now hand it back um, to Dennis, but don't worry, I'll be back. <laughs> Thanks, All right, so the study that, or the 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 uh, the big article, I guess, that sort of brought this study to the attention of um, of sophisticated consumers of of economic policy and tax policy uh, ran in, in the New York Times uh, in in late January. Uh, the title was uh, provocative. Black Americans are much more likely to face uh, tax audits, study fines. Um, and for the most part, um, what was going on here, so it was a study that was conducted, let me first say, by a bunch of economists um, throughout the country, uh, by two from Stanford, uh, two from Chicago, a bunch of uh, Treasury Department economists, and they were afforded just in a, a ridiculous amount of microdata uh, from or access to microdata from the IRS, uh, more than 148 million returns, more than 700,000 audits uh, between 2010 and 2000. I think it was 17 or 18, overwhelmingly from 2000 uh, from 2014. So the, the the data itself and the data crunching itself was um, was impressive, uh, but the findings, the overall findings, uh, African American taxpayers are audited three. Three times more often than other taxpayers, uh, you know, we have to ask initially, how is that even possible? I mean, you, the, the IRS does not ask for any information, explicit information anyway, uh, that has to do with your race. Um, there are various ways that, that they can try to get at that as um, different methodologies. And in fact, the study that Darian alluded to a second ago um, that the Treasury Department has undertaken is doing exactly that. But it is imperfect. Um, and they have to cross-reference census data and various other um, compilations of, um, of, of uh, demographic information. Uh, the tax forms, as you know, uh, in no way ask you for any sort of racial identification. Uh, and so 
the answer as to like, how is it possible that you have this outcome where a minority of the, uh, of the population are being audited vastly disproportionately more than the rest of the population. And it comes down to something as dorky as the algorithms that the IRS uses in order to um, help them identify where to focus their energies in terms of auditing taxpayers. Um, and even more specifically, as I say here, it's, it's really just how the IRS flags tax returns with potential heirs. Now, we know from decades of study that the tax returns we should be targeting are those tax returns of high income Americans, and in particular, those um, with business income. The non-compliance rate, so there's a huge tax gap every single year. The tax gap is in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And the vast majority of the tax gap comes from Americans, high income Americans with business income. Um, to, the, to, the, to the sort of, to the tune of 55% non-compliance among those taxpayers is what the, uh, is what the estimates are. Um, but those taxpayers are hard, hard to audit. Um, you do need, as I said a second ago, uh, an expert and robust tax system in order to audit those taxpayers. And so the algorithms over time have changed to get, if for lack of a better term, just like the low hanging fruit and where the IRS can identify non-compliance. So when you're talking about wage income or information or, or income that's subject to information reporting, so take your W-2 income, it's really hard to cheat on your W-2 income because that gets reported automatically by your employer every month to the IRS. <laughs> so there's 99% uh, compliance there and 1% non-compliance. I mean, you would be an idiot to try to evade your taxes on your wage income. Same thing with information reporting. That is like 1099s, miscellaneous income stuff. That, that's like 95% compliance rate. And so going after the returns that the IRS has information or taxpayers and their returns that the IRS has information already on, pretty specific and accurate information is where they started targeting um, their resources. That meant moving away from targeting wealthy Americans, overwhelmingly white, and targeting low and middle income Americans, overwhelmingly non-white. Um, the story here, uh, sorry, this very last thing. So flags returns with potential errors in claiming tax credits targeted to low middle to low to middle income Americans. And in particular, targeting uh, earned income tax credit uh, returns, pardon me, those returns that are uh, that, that seek to claim the, the, the earned income tax credit. Um, the earned income tax credit, um, uh, the, the politics and history of the earned income tax credit uh, make, it, um, uh, make it a perfect example of what we're trying to talk about today. That is this, in, this intersection between uh, tax and race and tax and, and, and racial justice. It also, all the, the, the remaining four items, those factors that we highlighted at the beginning are also um, perfectly represented in explaining why we have this outcome that the study produced where you have African-Americans being audited at significantly higher rates than all other taxpayers. So if, just a little bit of the politics and history. The Earned Income Tax Credit was created in 1975. Uh, it's a tax credit for the working poor. Um, it phases in. This is our this is our graph. Here's zero dollars worth of income going that way, and here's the rate of subsidy going that way. It phases in at a certain percentage. Um, it phases in pretty much like at 40 percent. So for every additional dollar you earn, you get 40 cents of a subsidy. It then stops phasing in and it plateaus over uh, over some income range uh, by which you continue to receive the exact same amount of, of, of tax credit and then it phases out at about 20 at about 20 percent it's got to phase out at some rate it can't be just a cliff because then you have the the concern that folks are just either going to fall off the cliff inadvertently or they're going to plan to just stop their labor force participation before they get to the cliff um, anyway this this particular tax credit um, was created because um, it was an effort, a long, like 15, 20 year effort by Congress, largely conservatives and, and, and uh, some libertarian economists to move away from the traditional welfare system. And in particular, a program called Aid to Families with Dependent Children, which was a, du a direct grant, federally uh, direct grant, um, direct subsidy, uh, means tested, meaning you had to go down to the welfare office and show your prove your worth uh, every couple of weeks and sometimes even more frequently than that, even weekly, depending on where you were. 
And the effort was to try to um, was, was to replace that with, uh, with with something else. Uh, conservatives saw waste and fraud and indolence. Uh, they identified um, uh, very explicitly what they were talking about when they were talking about um, uh, welfare recipients. They were talking about uh, the quote unquote welfare queen that Ronald Reagan brought to prominent public attention uh, in his campaign for president in 1976 and then again in 1980. And when he was talking about welfare queens and what the in the public imagination that he was trying to um, impress on um, on on Americans was that you were talking there about African American uh, women, unwed African American women with kids, uh, and that they were taking advantage of the system. And so the racialization of the welfare system preceded the EITC, but the EITC was a replacement for that welfare system, and it was sticky in terms of, oh, well, we replaced it with this, surely the same problem is going on. And so as the EITC then gets expanded in the 1980s and into the 1990s, um, sort of culminating in 1993, uh, critics of the program, you know, focused on its on on its quote unquote welfare characteristics, and called it welfare for the middle class. And it still had the racial connotations that AFDC did. And it was just difficult to kick that. Okay. And it's the the, the not so dirty little secret, by the way, is the program is worth it costs, let's say, a hundred billion dollars a year. Well, it's a refundable tax credit, meaning it can wipe out your tax liability and then also give you a cash payment. Where only about ten percent wipes out your cash liability. The other ninety percent, the other ninety billion, is in the form of a cash is is, is in the form of a cash subsidy from the federal government. So it's not wholly um, uh, inaccurate to call it welfare for the middle class if, in fact, you think that tax uh, that that cash uh, transfers are 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 considered welfare. All right. Um, bum, bum. So back to the study. Um, it was always hard uh, to audit high income taxpayers, especially those with business income um, and complex returns. You just need uh, a, a, an, an expert uh, tax agency and workforce to do that. The job became a whole heck of a lot harder, however, over the last uh, 15 years. It predates that a little bit, but the data that we have only goes back about 15 years, um, called a generation or two, as Congress just slashed IRS budgets. Um, the slashing of IRS budgets resulted in a significantly reduced workforce. So just over 11 years, uh, the budget got cut 20%. Um, that in turn resulted in uh, lower uh, or, or fewer staff, 22% fewer staff. And this then is all while the number of taxpayers and the number of returns is proliferating. Uh, so a whole heck of a lot less money to do a whole heck of a lot more than what they were used to doing. On top of that, as we know, the IRS has basically become a benefits administrator. And whenever there is something to be distributed, the government and Congress looks to <laughs> IRS to distribute that. So take the economic impact payments during COVID. The IRS processed those. It was an overwhelming success. Sure, there were some crazy things going on, like little old ladies in Italy who'd never been to the United States getting payments, but we can overlook that. It was a successful endeavor. Think about the expansion of the, of the child tax credit. The expansion of the child tax credit was, and it was an advanced payment where the Congress charged the IRS with delivering those benefits in real time, monthly, starting in June, 2021, all the way through the end of the year, to beneficiaries. As Darren was discussing, um, the ITC has a real anti-poverty component to it. Well, the advanced child tax credit by itself slashed child poverty by 47%. Okay. Same program, by the way, that Republicans decided not to re-up in January of 2023. Um, in addition to these various um, uh, results in terms of slashing IRS budgets. You have an inability to, oh, sorry, you have an, an enforcement staff. So part of the staff that got hit the hardest was the enforcement staff. That is those who actually enforce the law. Um, enforcement staff over just 11 years went down um, significantly from 50,000 to 35,000 employees. So this is part of the backfilling that the IRS is going to be doing with the funds that it got from the Inflation Reduction Act, part of the $80 billion. You know, this is this, this, is this uh, army of tax officials that are supposedly going to come out and shake you down. So, so be ready for that. Um, in addition to a fall in enforcement staff, you then also had this inability as a result of less expert enforcement staff and inability to uh, audit high income uh, business income tax returns, which again are overwhelmingly 
uh, filed by, by, by white taxpayers. This audit rate here, by the way, is 2.4% in 2019. Um, last year, the audit rate fell to so 1.1% for taxpayers with income over a million dollars. At the same time, the audit rate for EITC recipients over these years has risen sharply. Uh, the audit rate, this is 2018, as you can see, it still indicates that EITC recipients are being audited at lower rates. That has flipped now in 2000, in, uh, as a result of 2022 data, where EITC recipients are getting audited at a rate of about 1.7%. Uh, and as I just indicated to you, uh, those taxpayers that earn over a million dollars are getting audited at a rate of 1.1%. Of um, and so in order to maintain, in order to maintain amidst the, uh, all of these uh, difficulties, some kind of tax enforcement, uh, the IRS shifted from, had to shift because they simply couldn't do what they may have wanted to do with the high income returns. They, they, they shifted to low income returns. Um, those things where they, it was easier for them to conduct um, audits and identify errors, as I alluded to just a little bit ago, and also easier to spot um, and to, to spot uh, taxpayers that are reporting simple returns. And so what we're talking about there are those, are those returns, again, that are claiming tax credits, not just the ITC, but that, but, but that was the biggest of them. Um, because underreporting of income there can be easily tracked because for those taxpayers, you know, they don't have capital gains income. They don't have interest income from their investments. They have wage income. And so if you say that your income is a certain amount and you underreport it, in order to, let's say, the reason why I told you about the structure of the ITC, you phase in, you plateau, and then you phase out. If your income's over here, you're getting a lower credits over here. You're getting a, you're getting a lower credit. And so you have an, uh, a real incentive to underreport your income. So you get back into that plateau range where you get the highest part of your credit. Uh, and so the, the IRS can easily snag those and, and easily identify because all you have to do is just put up what the what the taxpayer says and what the and what the W two says, and it's it, it's it's easy to catch them. Um, the other thing too is that the uh, the the complexity I was talking about earlier. There's significant complexity not only in auditing business returns but also in complying with tax credits. I mean, as Darian indicated in the slides, like even when the tax system is doing something that is designed explicitly to help low and middle income taxpayers, the complexity involved in compliance is just off the charts. And so one of the most confusing sections of the Internal Revenue Code is section 152 pertaining to the to what a dependent is, uh, what, you know, what, what, what qualifies as a dependent. And so you end up for the ATC, uh, it, is, it, is, it is marked to your income, but it's also marked to the number of, of dependents you have, your qualifying children. And so you get significantly more, you, you get almost nothing. Actually, if you have no dependents, um, you, you actually only get a tax offset for the social security taxes that you pay throughout that year. Once you start having children, the tax credit goes up significantly. And so taxpayers want, they, they want to get credit for their, sorry, credit for their, for their, for their dependents. Well, the kind of taxpayers that we're talking about here, you know, sometimes don't have perfectly clean ways of sharing custody with, with uh, you, you know, with a, another parent. And so there are real rules that you have to follow and those rules are easy to get tripped up on. So the complexity also hurts compliance. Um, these returns, as I said earlier, uh, disproportionately were filed by, by, uh, by non-white taxpayers. Um, and, and the increased auditing of EITC recipients was uh, explicitly and implicitly endorsed by Congress. Um, at least half of which were predis predisposed already going back 40 years, predisposed to thinking about these taxpayers as, as welfare cheats and as living off the dole and as not being de deserving recipients and frankly being fraudsters. Um, turn it over to you. Wow, you left the remote. I think we're really getting over to again somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so final um, policy and law crossover. So this is um, another one of the charts, again, not surprising, showing the um, racial wealth gap, showing that it's um, big and not going anywhere. 
Um, one thing you might have heard about um, just out in the world is what about a wealth tax? A wealth tax would seem to be a way to kind of reduce the gap and um, reduce some of this inequality. Um, it seems like that Congress can just pass a wealth tax, right? Congress has the power to tax. Um, so what's all this hullabaloo about? Congress can't impose a wealth tax. Well, there's this provision um, relating to direct taxes. And the upside of this provision is if, if you have a direct tax, every state has to pay the same amount per capita, which would mean if we had a wealth tax, wealthy states like California and New York would have to pay as much per capita as poorer states, which is perceived as a crazy part of tax policy. And so therefore, if a wealth tax is a direct tax, not conceding that, then it's a problem under this provision. If I say, okay, well, fine, it's scarce to efficient. What's this stuff about three-fifths at the bottom of the clause? This is the three-fifths compromise, right? The most immoral provision of the Constitution is actually there um, in part um, to protect um, uh, slave states from taxation. Um, and right, so, so it's, it's, you know, here in the 21st century, the question of whether you can impose a wealth tax in part um, to reduce um, the racial wealth gap is arguably threatened by this provision put into place by um, over ratings at the time. Um, it's not clear that that's the right argument, uh, but in any event, just to understand um, uh, the connection. Property taxes. Property taxes are not a federal tax. They are the primary way local governments um, fund themselves, but it's worth talking just a little bit about them and also talk about a, um, a state constitutional um, provision. So studies show that property tax um, collections are also um, racially problematic in various ways. You might say, well, how can that be? Um, a property tax is just based on the value of the property. So, um, and so there are a few reasons. I mean, to some extent, it, 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 it there, you know, could be as direct as um, implicit bias, but there are sort of more subtle reasons um, as well. Um, one reason is that it's complicated and challenging to assess property taxes. And so who assesses, who challenges property taxes and sort of bludgeons their local county assessor to lower their tax rate, that's not evenly distributed. Um, it's hard for property tax assessors to keep up with property tax values if they're appreciating quickly. And so the faster property taxes are appreciating, the more likely the property tax assessors innocently will fall behind. Whereas in neighborhoods where property values are not increasing as much, um, property tax assessors can be very punctilious. Um, which, if you do, if you continue this process for decades, you end up in a situation um, where minority neighborhoods are paying a much higher um, percentage of their of, of much higher property taxes relative to the value of their properties. Um, oh yeah, great. And, and there are just a few sites um, to, to to some of the literature about that. So. State constitutions typically have rules regarding um, property taxation. They're called uniformity provisions. They date to the 19th century. And they'll typically say something like, all properties have to be taxed the same way. You can't distinguish between residential and commercial. You can't distinguish between different kinds of residential property. Everybody gets taxed the same way. Now, why would you have a rule like that? Well, one is, one is it's, it's protection against corruption, right? The county assessor can't charge higher rates um, to political enemies versus their friends. And you know, in the history of the property tax, there are examples of outright corruption. So we should um, sue. So, um, it's also a way to pre pre um, prevent progressive taxation, right? So it's, it's an, also a tool, right, to keep you say, well, that's a more valuable property. We're going to assess you at a higher rate, right? The uniformity provisions of the state constitution prevent that from happening. But where do they come from? Well, it turns out. Um, for a long time, historians thought they came from this anti-corruption rationale um, that people didn't want. Um, uh, county assessors to, to, to use property tax assessments as a weapon, but it turned out it was uh, the anti-progressive tax rationale, but in particular in the anti-bellum South to protect slave owners um, from having their property assessed at a higher rate. Um, so, you know, so there you have it, right? So the overlap of um, um, get overt racism and provisions that we still have, right, that are seemingly neutral, but again, even now um, prevent relatively progressive um, property taxation. Um, final slide, last note on states and localities. So to the extent <laughs> we talked about um, the tax expenditure budget and its upside down distribution at the federal level, um, a state like California with an income tax basically has the same distribution of income tax expenditures. 
But in general, state and local governments do not rely as much on income taxes. They rely much more on property taxes and sales taxes. Those taxes are more regressive. So to the extent your concern is with um, progressivity or regressivity of tax system, state and local governments are sort of much more aggressive, which is to say they raise much more of their revenue from poor people relative to what the federal government does. And, and this goes to the sufficiency of the tax base, um, state and local governments arguably just simply have insufficient tax bases, regressive or not, and that often leads to local governments, and this is one example of the um, um, phenomenon, um, funding basic services through fines. Right. So if you cannot pay, raise enough in taxes to fund your police and you tell the police you're going to self-fund through fines, well, the implications of that are pretty clear. Um, and, um, and you know, there are sort of well-known, spectacularly problematic examples of police forces being entrepreneurial um, in terms of raising their own funding. That's just not where you want your entrepreneurship um, to be. Um, so we, there are a lot of other, other resources. Um, this has been a speed um, race through, but there's uh, at, UC, at um, UC Irvine, they have a whole page of academic studies and the Treasury Department is, is explicitly studying it. There are some, this um, site has stuff on state stuff. And if you want to actually look at the um, racial implications of individual federal income tax provisions, you can go to that website and uh, manipulate it for yourself. And with that, um, that's all we have to present. We're happy to answer any questions. Please direct all hard questions to Dennis. <laughs> Thank you. Come on, class A. Questions, please. <laughs> Yes. Thank you both so much. Um, you spoke about the, the high non-compliance rates for people with high wealth and high income. And I guess within that, I'm really curious about all of the moves that I, I've heard or have been reading recently that the huh, quasi-legal, but really problematic moves that many attorneys or others make for high wealth families to avoid their responsibilities. And are there any policy opportunities or things, solutions on the horizon that seem to you to be getting at those problematic moves that get made to protect wealth and taxes? Sure. Um, so first off, there are plenty of ways that that high net worth individuals can reduce their taxes legally. Uh, and some of those are, are outrageous, but, but it's legal. And so ProPublica has done some incredible work on this. Uh, recently, they published a piece on the top 400 uh, households. That is those households that have uh, that report the highest AGI. I think AGI. I think the uh, adjusted gross income. I think the cutoff was somewhere around 200 million dollars to get into this elite group. Uh, and some of these taxpayers had an effective tax rate as low as five and six percent. Um, they take advantage, obviously, of getting their income in the form of uh, of capital gains, which is taxed at 20 percent. Um, and they also get uh, in, they 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 take advantage of tax exempt income, which is zero percent. Uh, but they also then take advantage of of legal tax expenditures that Darren highlighted that are in the tax code. So the charitable contribution deduction is one of them. Michael Bloomberg uh, has taken advantage of that. He's very philanthropic. Um, kudos to him. It also significantly reduces his tax bill to about four okay. percent. So that's the legal stuff. Uh, and you, we still may want to change those things. The illegal stuff, I mean, over the last generation or so, there's been a whole lot more information sharing among countries. Um, the, uh, the OECD has been, has been at the forefront of this. Um, there is an information sharing uh, initiative right now that the Republican Congress is holding up and is probably not going to sign off on, but you'll hear Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen talk about it a lot. And, um, and, and how important it is uh, to participate uh, because the whole idea of the information sharing, a lot of this happened after this, this, some of the uh, like AIG and Swiss banking scandals where um, you sort of pierce these, 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 these secrecy laws in countries that previously were unwilling to do so. If everybody's sharing, you know, it's, it, becomes, it becomes much more likely. So those initiatives I think are encouraging. Um, uh, it's a political hurdle here. Um, yeah, I mean, I, just to add to that, I mean, so, right, there are some things like 
we give a tax break to capture your gains, we have to just decide to decide what we want to do. Then there are things like the manipulation of state trust law, where we kind of know where the bodies are buried, right? I mean, uh, um, and we have there have been bills out there proposing to close some of those loopholes, but there's no again political will um to, to, to close them. Um and and then there are things that you know have to come, I think, to some of the legal profession, arguably in terms of what's ethical or not ethical in terms of helping clients to do. But then the final thing I just wanted to say is that there is a sense when you hear these stories of the wealthy and the use of their taxes, um, to sort of just give up. Say, right, you're never gonna see um, this is slippery like right? lawyers. And obviously on some level, right, there's probably true. Now I'm get 99 percent some of the complicated tax rates compared to somebody from the world. On the other hand, we can do a lot better. And I so I think there's a big spectrum. And so accepting that we're not going to get 99% of people at the people at the very top, that that's fine. But um it's not great from my perspective. But I think that's acceptable. To, um, and you don't have to say we have to get to up to 99% or we just have to be happy with the first. But there's a big middle. <laughs> If we just closed all the loopholes we know about and got up to 50%, then that would be a big win. I would be pretty happy with it. Maybe it's 50%. That's pretty lame. That's so big. It's really unfair. 50% would be good. I, I'd be happy with this. Um, so I I understand that like the I guess like the more money that people are making, it would make their um tax returns and stuff um, more complex. And so, but I'm just like wondering, wouldn't there still be such a high incentive to like focus on these people anyways, because the money that you would be getting back from them, you know, being caught for doing something wrong would be way higher than the, you know, a couple hundred or thousand dollars that you're getting from the people at the bottom that they're lying about or whatever. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You go after EITC filers, so the maximum EITC credit now for a family of three or a claimant of a uh, qualifying claimant for three children is somewhere, call it $6,500 or $7,000, which might be somewhere on the order of, you know, 20% of their household income, which is significant. Well, you have to multiply that by quite a few to get to non-compliance of just even in, moderately super rich person of let's say you know 10 or 15 million dollars and you have non-compliance of two or three million dollars it's a whole lot more eitc audits you have to go through than you do with that one now having said that they've also shifted in terms of like we talked about the personnel and the workforce and, and the expertise but there are things called correspondence audits that are really easy for the irs to push out and that's just a letter and when a, an unsophisticated taxpayer without a fleet of lawyers behind him or her gets a letter like that, they're scared and they have no way of knowing how and if they can challenge or appeal. Um, and sometimes they are so scared they don't do anything and that ends up getting considerably worse for them. But even if they just pay, um, I mean, they, they're, they, they might be perfectly, they might have filed perfectly fine and the IRS just wants to hear from them, but they don't really know how to respond. Um, and so there are there are costs beyond like just the dollar cost too. So you're absolutely right. It'd be nice if we had a workforce that could do that. I mean, literally, the administrative capacity isn't there right now. And I should just add just how painful those returns can be, right? I mean, there are two. One is that right, if I hold a bank account behind my back and the IRS doesn't know about it, how would it even select the audit? And then once you start doing the dance with the IRS, you know, you challenge them at every step of the way. Um, at some point, you're going to hire an expert, right? It, it, and then you can, and, and then if the IRS goes through all this trouble, they might just lose. <laughs> so if there's a, you know, they have a one percent chance of three million dollars, but they actually have a, you know, fifty percent chance. Of <laughs> um, so I'm not, there's not a justification, right? But you would think that they would, they would put more effort into it, but unless they have more resources, it's easier to get an audit, you know, a hundred thousand people for a thousand dollars each to audit. Um, this is just my personal sort of opinion or observation. This isn't a knowledge, not speaking on behalf of anybody or any organization. But just on that piece, I do also want to kind of point out a lot of these um, 
because of the lack of personnel or the expertise of some of the tax agencies, but um, because of that, a lot of these audits that um, kind of uh, that touched upon, like, why is it that it, it's something that's simpler? Why is it um, audited more? Some of it is to do to technology in that a lot of it is like, you can scan in these returns or not. Some of them, you know, all electronically filed. So um, a lot of the things that are simple, it's just computer generated. It's not a lot of times, it's not even a human behind. Like, a lot, I, I think a lot of the, you know, end result, and sometimes we see that with like AI or how things are selected, it's not really that intentional, some racial bias may not be in play, but it's sort of like if you choose something that you can use without human intervention or just you can calculate very easily or just the, the computer can do it, they can just spit out these sort of notices or, you know, um, asking like, hey, what is this? This doesn't match. Like all of these things, um, it can result, the end result without, um, you know, some thought about, you know, how you balance these, um, if you can have this result. And I think this is like an example of what happens. Um, and I would also say just, um, and this is coming from, I'm a tax practitioner. I was in the private sector for a long time as well. I'm with the state government now, but um, with these very complex sort of type returns, a lot of times, like um, you may have also read in the news, like um, some returns are so complex, you can't even file it electronically. Like you have, it, it's so complex that the system cannot recognize it. And this is like a very, you know, very high net return for this. Of course, that's an extreme example, but you can see how auditing that kind of return, even like trying to figure out well, then where if all the numbers are correct, if all the information is correct, that um, requires a, a tremendous amount of resources and expertise just to understand like, how that's working. So I think not to say that that should be some sort of way out and some excuse, but um, of course there are, you know, potential, um, you know, if, if the goal is real revenue gain, which I don't know if that's necessarily the case, but just to make sure that there is compliance, you can see why some sort of focus, especially if the tax agencies don't have the proper resources and how it ends up to be that, you know, those types of returns don't get touched to begin with, or if they do, that audit may take years and years. And just that's not kind of how it works. That's not a problem. I think our time is up. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys. Okay. <laughs>